morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us at this Free Market Foundation media briefing about the chaos that is SAA. Now, before I get started, I understand there has been some sort of bad accident on the highway, so we're still missing a few people, but because we live stream, we're going to go ahead anyway. Uh, so there may be one or two interruptions as people arrive. Um, I'm Jane Boccalioni. I look after media relations here at the Free Market Foundation. And today, our executive director, Leon Lowe, is going to be talking about, as I said, the chaos that is SAA. There's a lot of hype bandied about, and lately we've heard so much about the new board, the new CEO, the latest of nine turnaround strategies. Um, will the bailout be enough? Will it not be enough? Well, today, Leon is going to pull together a lot of facts and figures pull together the real story behind, well, uh, behind SAA and get away from the hype. So uh, we do have a lot to say, so I'm going to ask Leon straight away to uh, begin his presentation. And questions at the end? Yes, uh, questions are all very easy, but I might not know the answers. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yes, uh, I'm, uh, as I think some of you are familiar with the, my tradition of uh, of perhaps saying something that might shock or offend, and I intend to do exactly that today. And uh, I do intend to provide some answers where at the moment there might not be some, and to raise some questions where at the moment the questions, as far as I can tell, have not been at least publicly answered and addressed. So I'm going to go into the, uh, the story of what is going on over here and try to make some sense of it and try to say where we go uh, into the future with, with South African Airways. And that might also have some implications for other uh, state-owned enterprises or parastatals. And nobody really knows how many of them there are either. The numbers range from 500 to 100. It can be anything, but some of those aren't really state-owned enterprises. They're things like, you know, the Government Gazette or whatever. So it's very difficult to know. But SA Airways is perhaps the most relevant to us and the reason I think it is is because it is the only one that I'm aware of that as far as I can tell does no good whatsoever for South Africa. You can say SABC does and you can say Eskom does and you can say Alex Corps does and all of the others. There's lots of visible and conspicuous good that they do, maybe not on balance, but South African Airways seems to me to have no advantage of any consequence whatsoever. And if anyone here is from South African Airways or finds that hard to bear, I will try to justify that statement. Um, and it is particularly bad in my view because it is the most extreme example of a redistribution of wealth from the poor to the rich. Uh, and I'm going to give the extent of that redistribution. Every cent spent on South African Airways is not money taken from the taxpayer. There's this cliche, at taxpayers' expense. Uh, and if that were the case, it wouldn't be so bad because people think taxpayers are rich, and so why not make them pay? But no, it's not at taxpayers' expense. And I want to make this clear. When the government has a bailout for South African Airways or any other bailout, what it does is it reallocates money that has already been budgeted for some budgetary purpose. It takes it away from somewhere else. We never know where that's from. We never told, or you could, I suppose, if you do some detective work, find out. But the government doesn't go and ask taxpayers for more money, so it's not at their expense. It has what it's taken from them, and that's that. What it does is it takes money from the rest of the budget, and to know where it takes it from, the only way I can think of to reach a conclusion is to say it takes it from the average amount that is spent in the budget most of which is on social grants and welfare and housing and health care and pensions and education and money that is spent largely on low-income people, on the poor. Um, so that is where the money is taken from. And so every time you have to say how many fewer houses are there, and even something radical, like how many more babies die in pediatric care because there is less money available for health care. It literally kills people when you take money away from something like health care. So, you know, there's less road care, there are more road fatalities, for example. So you have to understand the price you pay for reallocating spending is quite substantial, quite significant. And I always encourage people to say to themselves, 
when they say we f should, for example, pay teachers more, I always encourage people to say, well, what do you want less of? Do you want more rapes? In other words, less police. Do you want more people living in shacks and less housing? What is it that you want less of? If you want more of something, you want less of what? And it would be interesting if I could get people to have one dinner party at which instead of saying what they should be more of, they spend the dinner party saying what they want less of. That'll be an interesting challenge to say, you know, I think not enough babies are dying. Well, I think not enough people are being raped. That is what you are saying every time you say there should be a reallocation of funding. So we'll go into that. Get the politicians to understand. <laughs> yes. The SA Airways is pouring money into the clouds, not a down a not down a pit, but into the clouds. And why do we want SAA? And I want to start off with that, because, you know, it fascinates me the arguments that are raised for wanting to have it at all. If it weren't there, would somebody suggest creating it, if it didn't exist, if the state didn't have it? Would someone say, let's have an SAA? And what would they say the reason is for wanting one? What I will. There's the old, the old cliche of the flag carrier. Now, I, you know, we used to hear this, and we used to literally fly up at 40,000 feet, uh, lighting the flag in the hope that some, I don't know, some uh, high-flying bird would spot it, or some <laughs> passing airline or something. But this flying of the flag has got to be one of the most stupid arguments that there can possibly be. Who on earth sees the plane? A few people in an airport, and if you want to fly the flag, for heaven's sake, buy a flagpole and put it in the middle of Beijing or somewhere. I mean, you can fly South African flags by the thousand in all the capitals of the world and have them very conspicuous and very visible. Uh, but to fly the flag on the back of an aeroplane <coughs> flying at 40,000 feet is about as ludicrous as flying a flag can get. I suppose you can fly a flag at the bottom of western deep levels in the dark. That is probably somewhat more ludicrous. But that's got to be the most stupid argument that is ever raised, and it's repeated endlessly, flying the flag, so-called. Um, and then, uh, you know, the tyranny of twaddle continues, and I'm going to go through the arguments that have been given for why one would want to have a South African Airways, and I'm going to get into if anyone here is from South African Airways or a trade union, the job creation issue. We need to talk about that. It destroys jobs in the airline industry. It doesn't create them, and we'll see why. So the flag carrier, as I say, rather fly flag poles. And then to have a South African presence, we are told. A presence. Now, you go to some airport somewhere miles out of some town, and there's a plane somewhere on a runway, that probably almost nobody actually sees. Maybe a few passengers walking past a window, and they wouldn't actually have any idea which airline it is. They might read the name South African Airways, but the flag wouldn't mean anything to them, as do the flags of other countries that you see on runways. But what, are they, what is meant by a presence? Being, you know, what is it, having an office in New York somewhere in some obscure building that it's difficult to find, as I've had to try to do in the past. Um, so it's just a cliché. It's just a, it's a meaningless, vacuous word without any content. Then there's a question of national pride, so-called. Well, surely you should be ashamed of it. It's a source of shame, not pride. It's an embarrassment. Uh, and it's an embarrassment twice over, twice over, not because it's such a failure and a perpetual failure, but it's an embarrassment because most advanced countries no longer have so-called national lives or national airlines. It used to be common, but pretty much all have been sold or disposed of or liquidated, whether it's Swiss Air or British Airways or whatever. Uh, they all now are no longer run by government. In fact, nowadays, if a government has a national airline, if a government owns an airline, the chances are it's a banana republic. The chances are it's a backward country. So having an airline is now something to be embarrassed and shy about. You don't want to go around the world saying, I come from a country where the government runs an airline. Uh, that is no longer something you would want to tell people you're trying to impress, you know, sort of chatting up someone over a candlelit dinner. Oh, by the way, in my country, my government owns an airline. You know, this has somehow got to 
kind of work. We've got nothing else to boast about. <laughs> we have lots of else to boast about. I've actually done a talk on what we can boast about, which is a lot. I'm one of the optimists about South Africa who think it's not nearly as bad as is generally thought. But this is. This is worse than is generally thought. It said that there must be strategic routes. What on earth does that mean? You know, you want the airline to fly to some place that no other airline wants to fly to. <coughs> and as far as I can tell, there is no such place. I have been to some pretty weird and obscure places where there's a landing strip you can fly. <coughs> you might have to go through one stop on the way. In other words, the most it can possibly do is save you having to have a connecting flight somewhere. But if you fly most places in the world, you connect anyway. So there is no such thing as a strategic route. It's, it's strategic nonsense to say that. You can fly wherever you want to at any time, and for South African Airways to add a flight to there, to somewhere, Timbuktu, is of no real value to anybody. You can fly to Timbuktu without it. And uh, you can fly there probably when you want to and more cheaply. And so it's also just a silly idea. Unserviced routes. Well, of course they're unserviced routes. And they should be unserviced. There's a landing strip in the middle of the Kalahari uh, near a place called Hansi, which is where the track Boers went after the Boer War. So no, no commercial airline flies there. So it's an unserviced route. Does that mean that, the, that SA Airways should start flying to Hansi in the middle of the Kalahari? The answer is clearly no. Unserviced routes should be unserviced. They're, they're unserviced for a very good reason. And we certainly shouldn't go and service routes in East Africa or West Africa that are not now serviced. Then it is said tourism and tourism promotion and South Africa promotion. Well, this is closest I've come to to some kind of vaguely plausible argument. It probably is true that if you fly South African Airways as a foreigner, you somehow get exposed to at least the in-flight magazine that tells you about maybe opportunities for tourism in South Africa and maybe promotes South Africa to some extent. But it really does very little. And again, it's like the flag carrier. Put up a flagpole somewhere. If you want to do tourism, run a website or get onto social media or give promotional material to travel agencies or whatever it might be. They're, they're much, much cheaper and better ways of promoting tourism uh, for South Africa and promoting South Africa in general. Then it is said that it promotes development and the GDP. It, I've seen this weird argument that the amount spent by South African Airways is added to the GDP. No, it's subtracted from the GDP. It makes us poorer, not richer. Now, the GDP for the economists here, you will know the way it's calculated. It is a very odd calculation. And we tend to use it because it's the best we have for what a country's wealth is. But let's be very clear about it. Lots of stuff in the GDP is not an addition to wealth. The most obvious example is the Defence Force. It's there for good reason. I mean, you obviously want it, uh, you know, but... It's not, it's not an addition to the GDP, yet it's put into the GDP the way national accounts are done. If you buy a plane, for example, a, a, a tank, and roll it into Harare. Um, and then, talk of war, one of the arguments was we need the government to own aircraft in case they need them in a war. Literally, uh, I mean... I'm surprised you're not all laughing. You should, and that's going to be my best joke today, <laughs> uh, is that we need to own airlines to fight wars. Against who? <laughs> and how, you, you can take a South African Airways plane and go and sort of bomb Maputo or something. Uh, who are we going to fight in this war? And of what use would the plane be in this war? So again, very, very peculiar argument. And we have plans in the Defence Force. I do an annual economics training course at the South African Defence Force, and I know them quite well, and I'm quite friendly with them. And as it happens, uh, we, we don't need South African Airways plans, apart from which South African Airways doesn't actually have any plans, or virtually none anyway. It leases them. So they're not available for war if we went to war. So that is, again, like flying the national flag or whatever. It, it gets so stupid that it's actually embarrassing to have to even discuss it. 
as, as these arguments, and they're raised by people who really should know better. Then procurement and transformation. Now again, if there's any potential benefit, this is it, that you can have local procurement and you can promote transformation in some way, but you can do that anyway. That's what codes do, what BEE does. You don't need the government to own something to, tra to have transformation. That's what is debated and happened and implemented all along. And procurement. Uh, the percentage of the GDP that SAA Airways procures is negligible. And in any event, the procurement turns out to be largely imports anyway via maybe some local front or intermediary company. There's not much that the airlines need, that SAA needs, that is produced locally except food, which foreign airlines buy here anyway when they take off from South Africa. So there's all the procurement takes place anyway. Um, then the answer is jobs and unions. Now, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this, the argument about unions. The unions will cause a problem, and they will. And the interesting thing is why. Because SA Airways is reducing the quantity of opportunities available in South African skies, the quantity of flights that could take place in and out of South Africa, the quantity of domestic flights, and therefore the quantity of jobs. It is not at all clear that if South African airways were shut down tonight at midnight, that a year from now there would be fewer jobs for the people who now have jobs and people who don't. So the chances are everyone who is now working for SA Airways would have a job with another airline almost immediately, probably within a week or two, and maybe a better job, a better paying job with better advancement possibilities. In fact, the unions ought to be in the absolute front of the queue beating the drum, saying we must put an end to this nonsense, this farce, which is actually very, very bad for workers and their members and their constituency. And then there's an interesting one, Peter Bruce of all people, for whom I have the highest regard, Business Day, made a really strange argument that he just thinks there should be a South African Airways. He kind of wants one. It kind of gives him a nice, warm and fuzzy feeling, sort of just because it's there. <laughs> Uh, you know, now that's very strange. If it weren't there, would he want one? And the answer is obviously no. He wants it because it's there. It's a sort of like, it's just there. It makes him feel good. So keep it there for that reason, which is somewhat, somewhat weird. It's like a sort of a, you know, I've said that the planes in the sky are pterodactyls flying around, the apartheid dinosaur of the past. Why? Because the apartheid regime ran this monopoly should we now sort of like it and feel good about it and want it? For, it's a very, in my view, a very odd sort of reason. Then um, I'm going to show you lots of data here, which I don't expect you to be able to read, but I'm going to draw your attention to the bottom lines, which is this is taken directly and plagiarized from the transport aviation economist Joachim von Wurten, Joachim von Wurten as he's better known. And uh, his data shows that we've had, uh, since the government, and I'm going to talk about Transnet in a moment, the government took over South African Airways about 10 years, about th and I've rounded the numbers up, about 30 billion or about 3 billion a year is what has been lost or wasted or money poured into the clouds as opposed to down the pit. And, um, and then if you look at under Transnet what happened, and the answer is when you put the two of them together, the bottom line is you're looking at something like 46 billion rand, which is the equivalent to 5 million RDP houses. Now that means that every single shack in South Africa could have been replaced by a house four times over. It's estimated that there's something like 1.4 million shacks and we have spent enough on South African Airways to provide every single South African with a house. That is what we could have done easily and had lots to spare to do other stuff, student fees, and service <coughs> delivery and social grants and more. Now, if anyone wants these data, they, he has made them public, they're available, anyone can, I will give you all the actual numbers and there's a lot more that I have from him which he's, uh, he's happy to make available. Uh, he's probably produced the most empirical data that is available from anyone in South Africa. Now, I don't know why all this came up together. It shouldn't have, but anyway, the point he makes and I make is that the 
10 billion which is now proposed and we sometimes call it's called recapitalization or it's called operating capital or whatever it might be uh, but it's not enough and this is why is South African Airways is technically insolvent by 12 billion as of the 31st of March uh, add the 17 2017 losses as reported in Parliament of another uh, 4.8 South African Airways is essentially insolvent to the extent of about 17 billion. And these numbers really can round them off. Um, so after the proposed 10 billion recapitalization, South African Airways will still be 7 billion short. And that's assuming no further losses which have been predicted and budgeted for. In other words, that's the best case scenario. So South African Airways needs 17 billion to be worth zero. 17 billion will give you an airline worth nothing. That's really what the numbers are telling you. And that's a hell of an investment for nothing. I think I can think of better ways of getting nothing. I offer you nothing at a much lower price. If you want nothing, come to me. I'm selling nothing at a big discount today. Um, and uh, you can add future losses say 4 billion a year, which is what we're looking at. And again, who knows whether strategies turn around, cutting routes, keeping routes, paying lease agreements, paying somebody who's just walked into the room. I'll get back to them in a moment, what they owed. And you have no idea what it's going to be per year. But let's choose a number, 4 billion. South Africa needs 29 billion to be worth zero in three years. So now if you want zero in three years, again, I will give you a bulk discount. I promise you, you can get zero for the best price in town from me. I'm, I'm, I'm selling zero at a real big discount, much less than 29 billion or 30 billion roughly. And, uh, and you can add past losses, the total past losses. If you add losses to current losses without the next three years, you're looking at something like 75 billion. That's the equivalent of 750,000 RDP houses. That's 50% of all unhoused people in South Africa. Or 1.5 million students could have student fees fully funded. There are, in fact, 350,000. So you're looking at, that's what you always have to understand. Your fees must fall Welfare must be paid, housing done, training, education, policing, health care, national health insurance, whatever. That's what you give up to the extent of very large sums of money, which are almost too big to, to um, contemplate. So South African Airways can't be rescued. It's nose diving and it's not going to stop and it's going to end up, uh, it should just be grounded. Uh, you know, th this one should just have been left there. They shouldn't have actually tried. Oh, there this as well. Just leave them. Don't, don't try and get them going again. Um, just, just leave them where they are. And this is why. We're now going to look into why it should be grounded, why it should not be rescued. And the answer is um, turning people around, endless turnarounds. Jane mentioned 10 turnarounds. I, I, I can't really work out how many turnarounds new plans and strategies and things there have been. I should imagine it's many more than 10. Uh, but everyone who's been turned around that many times is now too dizzy really to run an airline. So you certainly don't want pilots who you've turned around umpteen times trying to fly. That would not be a good idea. But nonetheless, South African Airways is now an empty <laughs> shell of debt. It really is not worth rescuing. I was on... Uh, radio yesterday morning with Professor Rousseau, head of WITS uh, Business Economics, and uh, he was saying that three or four years ago he was advocating that South African Airways be sold, and he now said, looking on air, he said he's now unfortunately reached the conclusion, having looked at the numbers, that it actually can't be sold. His words were, you can't give it to somebody for free. Uh, the only thing you can do with it if you're handed it and all the debt and all the guarantees are paid off and you're told, here's the shell, the only thing you can do is stop flying because the flights themselves generate more losses and start selling what little you've got. Now, I've tried to get some estimates of how much it's worth and the numbers seem to range from maybe 30 to 40 billion rand that you could 
get by selling everything it has. I'm going to get back to that in a moment. And have no more debts. In or it, to which end you have to stop flying. You have to stop operating. Or maybe fly whatever routes can actually run at a profit. Um, so it has... Any, nobody really can tell me how many assets it would have, how much you could get by selling it, and his of the view, you can't. He said, no one, you can't give it away anymore. And he has himself, like Joachim von Merton, studied the data. Uh, there are unknown and undisclosed liabilities in South African Airways. For example, 1.1 billion in terms of a court order that's owed to Comair, never mentioned, and Kame is asking for that to be increased to 1.8 billion, and there's a reasonable chance of succeeding. And, uh, and, but there are many others. How much does it owe the airports company? How much does it owe, owe suppliers? How much does it owe for procurement? How much does it owe people who do training uh, for, for uh, uh, other things like in its workshops and so on, computers, whatever? Mm. But it's not clear. Again, this ought to really all be public knowledge. And... Uh, then uh, it is, as I said, the, an extreme and, in my view, quite obscene redistribution to the rich. I suspect everyone in this room flies, has flown, and probably will fly, and some in this room I know, because I can see some of them fly frequently, uh, like Paul, for example. Where's Paul? He's hiding away from me. But he would be... Oh, there he sits. So I'm sure he flies often. That's why his office is near the airport. But, uh, and so do others. But now, every time you fly, and I've tried to get this number, I can't get the exact number, but the, it seems as if it's something like 500 rand is paid by the shacks over which you fly. When you fly from the airport, you fly over a very big shanty town. It's called Marathon and Delport, or S&J, and you see it next to a gold mine. It's got 60 to 80,000 people living in the shack there, shacks. Every time you fly over it, you should see, look down on it and say, those people are paying 500 rand for my bum to be on the seat. Roughly. Uh, they are, you are being paid for to fly by those people. That's really hard to understand it. And as it happens, we have a close connection with that community. We're busy involved in trying to get that township formalized and upgraded and to get title deeds for the residents there. So whenever I go there and I see these plans taking off and landing, I think, yes, these people living in boxes and tin sheds are paying for those people to fly. That is what, how, how obnoxious it is. Um, one billion rand, just to give some feeling, because the number, what does it mean? It means 10,000 houses or 20,000 students, roughly, uh, can be funded every billion. We're talking about three, four, five billion a year. It's unfair discrimination against the other private airlines. It is just not fair uh, for the government to give subsidies and guarantees to someone who competes with someone else. Uh, the same is true, for example, of SABC. SABC should not be allowed to compete in the commercial space. If you want community radio, break it off and have non-commercial community radio and then the government can try and run a commercial radio station competing with private radio and TV stations. And that is how everything the government does commercially should be. If it wants to be run a commercial bank, for example, it now wants to create a commercial mobile network operator called a WAN, a wireless open access network, it should then be a level playing field. It should not get any more subsidies and it should have no more guarantees and it should not pay any less interest and have any tax breaks that are not available to the people with whom it directly competes. Then, frankly, I personally, as a free market person, wouldn't mind. If the government can run things competitively and efficiently, I have no concern with it. Uh, but at the moment, it's running them inefficiently and it is driven probably over 10 airlines out of business by this unfair discrimination against private competitors. It enters into these bilaterals internationally and local coded routes and so on. It's all very complicated stuff in terms of which it basically limits the number of flights. So take tourism. These bilateral agreements, every country into and out of which we fly, there's one other airline that flies in and we fly out and there's a deal as to how much that is done and what South African Airways does because it 
can't operate efficiently and competitively. It limits the number of flights other airlines can do in and out of South Africa. It has only 18%, less than 18 of the international um, capacity. And yet it limits the number of flights that can come into South Africa, bring business people, bring tourists, and promote South Africa, the very things that SA Airways is meant to be doing. Other airlines would like to do more of, but can't. They are prevented by our... Um, so we lose jobs and tourism, and we lose business opportunities and much more. About 40% 40 40 of South African airways has already been privatized. Now, people don't actually realize this because there was no formal privatization. But the mere fact that we got local open sky, so-called deregulation, liberalization, <coughs> so private airlines could fly in the domestic market, South African airways lost um, about 40% uh, of the market it had. So it's 40% has in fact been privatized. And instead of selling that 40% and getting money for it, it subsidized the process of losing its market. It's, it's kind of weird. It's like paying someone. No one actually got paid. It's like, it's like just throwing money down a ditch in order to privatize, you see. Normally, when you privatize, you expect to get revenue. This was private. This was sort of the opposite. This was privatizing by losing, not by selling. And uh, in the international market, we're looking at something like 17 or 18 percent. Uh, these are numbers here. Again, I don't expect you to look at them, but these are, I don't understand it fully myself, but most of the routes in South Africa are 100 percent SA Airways, and they are somehow restricted or monopolized, and those are ones where there are private competitors. But this is the area, small capacity, the big routes have competitors, the smaller routes tend not to, but nonetheless there are restrictions on private people entering into the airline business. Now just think of the transformational implications. If small little emerging airline companies can be BE companies, transformed companies were free to enter into and fly all of these routes, what opportunities there might be. Now, why South Africa should not be rescued just to continue? It distorts markets, obviously. It's very bad for uh, uh, to have one loss-making operation operating against a profit-making one, bearing in mind that the private airlines pay tax. SA Airways collects tax. So you might as well actually just send someone from SA Airways to British Airways every morning with a bag and say, right, just fill it with money for me and then go back. Because that's really what happens. It goes through a sort of merry-go-round and then ends up back in their pocket. Now, that is not a way to serve consumers or anybody to, to do that. It's unfair discrimination. I've mentioned that. Ten airlines driven into insolvency. South Africa subsidized others taxed. And in the end, consumers are victimized. Consumers are the victims. And they uh, have less choice, they have higher prices, they have inefficiency, and there's some reason to believe maybe compromised safety. So what about South Africa's Airways new board? What can its new board do? Now, I've been on any number of radio and TV programs where I get asked, what is your advice to SA Airways new board? Now, SA Airways new board is a, another board without aviation expertise. One of the members supposedly has aviation expertise, but I'm told that this is not of any particular relevance or value at all in that case, uh, for reasons that we can go into if you want to. But nonetheless, what should this new board do? Now, this is where I have a very strong view. And if you think what I've said up to now has been too timid and mild and reticent, let me now spell it out. This board is operating a reckless business, as defined in the company law. Now, this is, many people have wanted this to become a criminal offence. At the moment, it generates very substantial personal liability. In other words, every board member, knowing that they are operating a fundamentally insolvent business, is personally liable for all of that business's liabilities to all its creditors. And, uh, the, and whether they are liable enough depends on whether they can argue, they could argue, 
we could reasonably assume the government would bail us out. In other words, on paper, it is clearly, comprehensively, incontestably insolvent. But you could, if you're a board member, say, based on past behavior of the government, it's not reckless because it's reasonable to assume we'll be bailed out. That is what would rescue them from being absolutely reprehensible directors under the company's law, company law. Um, so can you assume government bailouts will come? It seems to me it's debatable, but I don't think you, you're entitled to run a business on an assumption that you are inherently insolvent and the government will bail you out. Uh, that seems to me to be a difficult case to make when you go to court and you're being sued for personal liability. And then the question is, is it, it, it is insolvent by the two major company law criteria, and that means the directors must, they are obligated under company law, to do one of two things. Now, whether they are personally liable is another matter, but let's assume they can somehow escape that by saying that running this insolvent business is not reckless. They still cannot escape this. They must apply for business rescue. They're obligated to, under the company law. That they can only do if there's a plausible reason to believe the company can be rescued. If you can't rescue it, then what you have to do under company law is notify creditors that the company is insolvent. A normal company, the creditors would put the company, would have the company wound up and have a distribution of assets if you can find any to creditors. But in this case, you may not. The South African Airways Act says that the creditors may not do what they can in the case of another company. Only the government can wind South African Airways up. So what you would have to do is inform the creditors that the business is insolvent. And as I read the company law, the board of directors are obligated, as of now, to either apply for business rescue or send a notice to creditors saying this company is insolvent. Don't do that, they're in violation of the Companies Act. And uh, they must prove to the, that, that it must be liquidated if it's not uh, reasonably recoverable. And when they notify creditors, they trigger, trigger default provision. That effectively is saying to creditors, we're defaulting. And the creditors can then proceed on an assumption of defaults. And uh, that means, although they can't wind it up, they can't get a winding up order, what they can do is they can attach assets and they can cancel contracts. Now, it seems to me the company law requires that of these directors. I don't see how they can escape that liability under company law. And if they, if somebody here has reason to believe they can or can explain to me why, I see you sitting over there who's a lawyer himself, a company lawyer of note, and he can tell me if I'm wrong. Now, at the moment, he's looked at me with a puzzled look on his face. He hasn't nodded or shaken his head, so I don't know whether he agrees or disagrees, but I would love to know afterwards or even during discussion time, you what you think about the obligations of the existing Board of Directors of South African Airways, assuming it is, as defined in company law, in fact insolvent. What, what must they do? And that, to me, is a, is a, a question that has not been asked or answered. Um, the, the, so what are the implications of closure, which seems to me the only thing you can do? It has to be wound down and closed. It can't be rescued, can't be turned around, except at insanely high cost that no sensible person could possibly justify. Um, it, it's actually much cheaper and better just to start a new airline. If the government wants an airline for whatever strange reason, you know, to have war planes or whatever, uh, then it must just build a new one, start a new one, and abandon South African Airways. So what do you do? You wind it down. You determine the least cost and the least disruptive way of doing it, try to ensure that passengers that have tickets get their tickets honored by other airlines. You try to get other airlines to take over the viable routes. If you want any of those routes to operate and they're not viable, you then call for bids and tenders, and you pay whatever it costs to keep that route going if that's really what you want to do for some reason. Uh, so others will take over viable routes almost immediately. I have asked people in the airline industry how long it will take, and I haven't really got a clear answer, but in some cases they reckon almost within hours. Some cases may take a few days or weeks. 
But certainly very, very, very quickly, all of the routes will be serviced by, by other airlines that will move into the voids. Um, and what you do is you, 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 you uh, say to yourself, what are the strategic routes, if there are such things, whatever that means, you call for bids. So in the winding down process, what the Department of Transport a public enterprises department or whichever one wants to do this can say we are we want to run a route <coughs> to um, to Wagadugu or we want to run a route to Khansi uh, where these old Boer trekkers are now living in the middle of the Kalahari uh, you know give us bids we ask Kome you know how much will you charge us to fly there once a year assuming you know that will be or well, I don't know how often you want to fly once an hour I don't know however many flights they want on these so-called strategic routes. So you discontinue these routes or you subsidize them. You get some viable, sensible, efficient, friendly, courteous. I have to say that because they're sitting in the room. Uh, airline to take over, you see. Th that, by the way, is uh, not clear which airline this is, but you don't need this in order to have that. Um, now, this is headed towards the close. Joachim from Wurten's options presented to Parliament this week. And again, I don't expect you to read the small print. If anyone wants the detail, I'll give it to you. Essentially, his view is that it can be rescued by this plan. Some very radical, very dramatic actions can be taken. Uh, in order to rescue it and uh, rescue what's left of it. And you can follow models that he refers to of other international airlines. And I'm not going to into this, but he says it's possible to rescue SA Airways, but you have to act immediately and you have to act dramatically and you have to do really quite startling stuff. You can't mess around with another bailout and another guarantee. You've got to stop playing games which is essentially what he says, but not with those words. And his option two really amounts to wind it down. So he says, either do the first, which is very radical, transformation and winding and, and refocusing the business and restructuring and designing in a very radical, substantial way. Anyone who wants to, we can go back to that slide and look at the detail. Anyone from the media can have his presentation, which I have available to give you, and uh, or basically just just run it down and, as I said, find a, a way out. Just to, you know, employ a team and get the board to have the job of closing it down, and they must just work out how best to do that. And they might, to that end, have to have some subsidies and bailouts and help in order to put an end to the misery and the pain, and sink one of the really completely irrational apartheid dinosaurs that flies pterodactyls and anyone who doesn't know what a pterodactyl is you have to be quite old to have seen one uh, pterodactyls are old extinct things that used to fly the biggest flying object the, the, the animal there's been was a pterodactyl at the time of the di the dinosaurs there were various episodes of dinosaurs uh, and if you like me have been around since the Permian extinction you're familiar with them all but nonetheless what South African Airways does is flies pterodactyls about the sky. And uh, so with that, uh, let me say we, I close and I invite questions and discussion. And as I say, um, I might not know the answers, but there are some people in the room who might know the answers. And I've tried to raise some questions and provide some answers, but I don't have all the answers. With the best will in the world, and I'm a loyal, patriotic, proud South African, I probably have a similar feeling to what Peter Bruce has regarding this part of my life, part of South Africa. It's like, I don't know, Cook Sisters or something. You know, they're just sort of there, even if I don't eat any. It's kind of nice to know that we have Cook Sisters and Milk Tart, even though I don't have them. Uh, you know, or Khaki Boss or something. But uh, I, I, it would, in the best will in the world, I would like South African Airways somehow still to be there. I understand Peter Bruce's sentiment and emotion, but not at this price. And it's not rational. 
and I can't see any way in which keeping it going can be justified. And I repeat, if the government really wants an airline, for some reason, no good reason has yet been given as to why it wants one. No plausible reason, no reason that survives any kind of analysis whatsoever. But let's assume there is one, or it just wants one. It just like, feels like having one. Shut Airway SAA down and start a new airline. That's the only way to have a national airline sensibly, rationally, and responsibly. And stop fleecing the poor to subsidize this folly that we've inherited from apartheid. Thank you. That, that article by Peter Bruce, I also read, and I actually responded to it. But he went on to say, other than he'd like to keep it for those fuzzy reasons you mentioned, he said, then you should break it into a good and bad. Yeah. You know, And he said, um, we should uh, keep the good going because that's easy, and the bad must have with this whole turnaround stuff. And, you know, similar to that, mm. that man you quoted, that complicated mm. man. Mm. And, um, I, I, you know, that to me was crazy because even that chap's po uh, um, suggestion there, that option one, is undoable. Who, where are you going to get the skills to do that? It's, it's actually, it's not, it's it's not, it's it's not feasible. Yeah. So where's my logic wrong? Because I wrote a letter back and said, as, you know, we don't need it, exactly what you said. Just put it up for tender, you know, and you may get one rand, you may have to pay people to buy it. But then let whoever takes it over to all the selling of assets or restructuring and keep some routes and give some routes away and let them, let the come here boys, I mean someone who knows the game. Now is that too simplistic? Or is that sort of what you're saying anyway? Or I, d I don't know that there is a simple answer. I think no matter what one does it's complicated. Yeah. But what you have, and I, I think what he was saying, as Joachim from Wirtan is saying, is it's complicated. I think I agree, the, the complication is simply unattainable. It's not feasible, it can't be done. So what you really have to do is appoint some liquidator or some company, some experts, a team of experts, uh, some of whom are in this room, to sit down and say, let's wind this down. Let, let's get rid of this nightmare. Why can't they just sell it? Because no one will buy it. As, as Professor Rousseau says, you can't give it to anyone. But you pay them, you, they will buy, they sell, they sell. Well, the, the there's an interesting idea that Terry Markman, a transportation expert as well, sitting in the back there, came up with years ago. And he said, what you do is you say, I want bids for the lowest subsidy at exactly. which you will That's wind it up. In other words, you say, how much money must you know, pay put in a bid? And Comair comes along and says, well, we'll we need 10 billion to okay. wind it down. And someone else says, well, I'll do it for five. No. Yeah. And then it's got to be something approved by a team of experts. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. So that, that you could do is how much will you pay to, to wind it down in a, in a least painful way? And look after the workers and see that they get new jobs, the employees yeah. and so on. I mean, I'm happy to do that. That's not the problem. You don't want to get rid of the people working there, excessive though they might be compared to other airlines. But, you know, you could either government, if we the government or the union, we could say, how much do you need to ensure that these people keep their jobs for a year? You know, get a bid. Get people to tender. Yeah. Um, Leon, why did SAA go wrong in nuts and bolts terms? What went wrong? I mean, there's talk of um, starting a new airline. Would they make the same mistakes? What were those? Wasn't that random? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I don't know, there, there's a technical answer and a philosophical answer. The technical answer I don't know. I don't know which bad management decisions were made. I don't know why this plan was leased instead of that one, which has four engines instead of two and is fuel economically inefficient. And they <laughs> entered into and bought plans when fuel was cheap and then it went up. And they were just, they were just bad management decisions along the way. And I'm not in the airline industry, and I therefore can't explain them. But the philosophical answer is quite easy. And I'm going to tell you a story about uh, you. you He's the company law guy who I thought was going to tell us about the board's <laughs> the liability, but he's, 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 he's escaping it. But nonetheless, we won't let him off the hook. But nonetheless, he's old enough to remember when we used to send Christmas cards. 
you know, those things that went, you put them in a letterbox and someone put them on the mantelpiece at home and so on, Merry Christmas, whatever. Now, there was this guy who'd forgotten, everyone, we all got late, you know, our Christmas cards comes along quickly. And this guy rushed into the CNA to buy Christmas cards late. And uh, there was pandemonium, Christmas shopping, crowds. And he got to the till and the young lady at the till was really looking exhausted. And he said sympathetically to her, some day, isn't it? And she said, yes, it's the best day we've had this year. And then he took his Christmas cards, put them in envelopes, put stamps, and he went to the post office to post them. And there was the usual Christmas mayhem, people sending parcels, long queues. And he got to the lady at the till at the counter, said sympathetically, some day, isn't it? And she said, yes, it's the worst day we've had this year. Uh -huh. The point is that in the private sector, a busy day is a good day. In the public sector, a busy day is a bad day. At the licensing department, the police station, everywhere in government, they want less work every day. In the private sector, everyone wants more work. The waiter wants the restaurant to be full. A government-run restaurant wants it to be empty. And you can't change that, you see. Philosophically, you can't actually, if you take the post office lady and you put her in the CNA, she will call a busy, that same person will call a busy day a good day. And you put the CNA one in the post office, that same person will call a busy day a bad day. So the point is government cannot run as efficiently as the private sector. It is not possible. You can't change the fact that in the government less work is good. And in the private sector more work is good. That is an inherent characteristic of the two institutions. And that is, I think, the philosophical reason why it went wrong, must go wrong, always will go wrong. You cannot change that. It's too fundamental. Yes, sir. Yes, I would like to add something to, to that. I'm actually involved in a comprehensive study of state-owned enterprises in another country. And one of the things that occurred to me uh, in my background research is that the name state ownership is actually a misnomer because there is no such thing. Uh, state ownership, there's no final natural or juristic person that is the beneficial owner of that enterprise. So it's not ownership in any normal sense of the word. The state cannot sell SAA or any other asset that it owns and retire to France and enjoy the proceeds. So the normal um, impetus behind ownership is simply not there. So even attaching the word ownership to it is bad. It is in fact nothing other than a patronage machine. So there is absolutely no reason, no matter how, if there's no reason for the state to, to, to efficiently operate something on a commercial basis, because why would it do it? Hmm. There's the, why would it just not, not do it and have less work to do? There isn't an entity with a self-interest in doing it well. No. no. I think that's a real problem which philosophically Socialists and Marxists, I used to be one myself, just never really have confronted. Is It is not in the self-interest of somebody in the state. I think you're right. It's this amorphous concept rather than an entity to do things well. Whereas everything else, whether even a, a non-profit charity, you know, my wife works for, uh, for hospice, for example, counsels people who are fatally ill. Uh, they have an incentive to do it well for two reasons. One is they're there because they care for the people and the other is they need to raise money. So they have to convince donors. So you're quite right. The state has no incentive to do things well. And that, that can't be changed. Yes. Well, sorry, let me just say it's a little bit extreme. Uh, the, the philosopher and historian Hans, uh, historian Hans Hermann Hoppe has a, a very elaborate theory that if the people called the state or the government have a long-term interest, for example, he says nobility and royalty have an interest in leaving wealth to progeny. So their self-interest is to see to it that the country is rich. Uh, but people who are in office for five years or for a short term have no such incentive. So he's of the view, uh, he's written a very interesting and profound book on what's wrong with democracy, that it generates short-term interests and whereas something more long-term generates longer-term interests, yeah. yeah. Have we any knowledge as to what 
guarantees the government has given in respect of SAA? And could it possibly be that those guarantees are so large that it becomes almost impossible to close it down? Yes, the, the, guar the guarantees uh, in detail, uh, we can supply you with those. They are known. I've got them here. Uh, um, yeah. guaranteed, the state has guaranteed up to 19.1 billion to SAA. 19.1 billion, of which 17.9 billion has been utilized. But what we don't know is uh, the impact of the latest um, 5 billion extra, the 10 billion. The, five, the extra 5 billion, has that come off the, the, uh, the guarantees? Or is it still in? <coughs> excuse me. Is it still in there? So, in the, uh, the press release that's coming out later, I've got two tables, and it shows the difference it makes between the uh, the, uh, the guarantees. So, uh, the latest figure that we have, unless perhaps somebody else in the audience knows, the latest we have, 17.9 billion has been drawn down, and possibly more, possibly another. This table which I showed, which the print was too small and is on my screen now, but not there. I'm not sure what's going on, but. Uh, Nonetheless, it has the full guarantees, all that detail that Jane has mentioned. Could that be the reason why they can't set it? No, the, the guarantees are a known quantity, and those guarantees are effectively a subsidy because they have to be paid. So, so they, they, to call them a guarantee is actually a bit of a misnomer. Uh, but uh, because a guarantee is a but the problem, there's another problem which the Treasury mentioned, that if there's a default on any one of those guarantees, it triggers a chain reaction for all other guarantees the state has issued. So it's not just South African Airways, it has to honor those which are a known amount. But if it defaults on any of them, or SA Airways does, then all of the rest in other state-owned enterprises, and I agree with your objection to the word state-owned, state amorphous enterprises, <laughs> Uh, well they, they would all be triggered and there would be a domino effect which would essentially bankrupt the Treasury. Uh, I saw a hand up in the corner there and then we come back out. Leon, Two there, one here. There was an empirical study done many years ago just to put numbers to your, your philosophical argument about the state versus private enterprise and business and so on. I think in the 80s somebody looked at about 20 or 30 airlines and rated them along efficiency uh, parameters such as number of employees per passenger and so on. And you literally could draw a line through the middle and all the efficient ones were privately owned and all the inefficient ones were state owned. And this is not South Africa, this is throughout the world. Mm. So there is, you know, it's not just a philosophical state, but it's, uh, it's an empirical. No, I think I, I, I do vaguely recall that as well. And, uh, and that was at the beginning, I think, of the sort of domino effect of privatizing and winding up state airlines. They, they became, they, they, they're now history. I mean, I don't know why we still do it. You, you literally, as I say, if you still have a state enterprise now, you should be an airline. You should be embarrassed to say you come from that country. Uh, yes, first here and then there. Hi, Leona. Um, as, a, as a somebody who's interested in business, it seems to me that it's very obvious that a business, whether it's state-owned or private, has assets and liabilities. And it also seems to me that, a, that a, something that is established, that is there, has some inherent value. If the inherent value of SA is simply that it's transporting people from point A to point B, to just take that out of the market, can you imagine the, the, the cost for the normal Kalula flyers, of which I'm, I'm one, Kalula is my preferred airline. So, so everybody else is going to flood Kalula, and the price is going to go up substantially, and so it, it is going to be a thorn in my, in my foot. So if I was given control of SAA, I would separate the assets and liabilities, I would take the assets, and, and including human resources, uh, airplanes, building properties, whatever, and I would try and get a management team that can run it efficiently, get rid of the, lo the loss-making routes, uh, increase your, your, your bums on seats. I mean, to give you an example, uh, I know some Malawians that travel between South Africa and Malawi, and they travel for days on a bus. Now, if you can fly, fill those, you know, put all those people on the plane, 
and fly it there, I'm sure there's, there, there's money to be made. Another opportunity, for instance, is all these schools that have inter-schools over a weekend. There's 800 to 1,000 people flying on a weekend like that. And if you can set up a route where you start in Durban, you bring one school to Joburg, you take another jo a school to Bloemfontein, uh, and from Bloemfontein to Stellenbosch and so on, and, and you circulate in the country in one week, you'll have, I don't know how many passengers. That, that's just some of the... Uh, so, my, I'm making a statement rather than asking a question. But my question really boils down to, isn't it worthwhile retaining the inherent value, the asset value of, of the business, instead of just killing it? Okay. No, I think there are two legs to that. One is what you would do if you were given this airways. You could un un unbundle it, have some plan, go and sit down <laughs> with your Hifford Wurton and say, do this instead of that. That's one issue. And that's a technical question and a technical question of what would you do if you were the CEO or if you were the board. Uh, I'm of the view that what you would do is you would wind it up. That gets us to the second leg with which I don't agree with you. I don't think there will be any disruption or inconvenience whatsoever. Bearing in mind the same planes still exist, the same runways, the same computers, the same skills and staff, everything is still there. All that happens is it's now run by someone else. And so, so what you will do is either other airlines, you know, Emirates or somebody will come in and fly domestic routes, international routes. If you just say the routes are open, uh, everywhere where anybody thinks they can, and I can assure you that Kalula and Comair and British Airways and Emirates and United Air and, Br and everyone will be trying to get in before someone else on the George route or the, the Peter Maritzburg route or whatever it might be. So wherever South African Airways withdraws, and you could do a painless way of doing it, you could say this route will be discontinued in two months, three months, whatever, to give other airlines an opportunity to consider what to do. And they can come to South African Airways and say, we want to take over your staff, your plan, your uh, technical services and so on. By all means, you can do deals like that. But the entity itself seems to me is inherently unrescuable. What you do with the assets, which is the second leg of your thing, is a different question. They will still be there and they will still be serving consumers and no consumer will be inconvenienced. On the contrary, consumers will be convenienced because there will be more airlines competing for their customers. The airport's company has the same shareholder as South African Airways. The airport's company posted a 2 billion rand profit this last year because they, have, they, have, a, they have a monopoly. So I can't see that this is totally independent given, given the same uh, shareholder. What always amazes me is how you can fly so much cheaper from that Syria because airport taxes are half the price of from Lower Tambo, which should have better economies of scale. Yeah, I, I, that's a statement. I, Sounds right. Uh, I think uh, airports company, you know, there's some interesting stories there. You know, for example, why Durban Airport was closed down and King Shaka Airport was opened at what cost? Or, for example, the fact that Comair Kalula wanted to take over Lanseria and operate it but weren't allowed to, were forced to allow other airlines. They couldn't just become the single owner operator out of Lanseria and so on. So there are lots of stories about airports. But I think also the main problem is that they are what you call monopolies. It might not be quite technically right, uh, but nonetheless they are a problem. And if you're running, if I said to anybody, would you rather run AXA or SA Airways, AXA effectively has no competitors, SA Airways effectively does, clearly you would take running AXA. A comment on the, on the AXA story, um, the way that, as I understand, I haven't for a long time, but the way that on the investment that they make. Mm. Uh, some of the people you know, for a moment, if they're going to build a new airport, it pays them to make the airport out of marble instead of concrete, because they put more money in it, so 10% of a bigger number is a lot, a lot more money. So they, 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 they are guaranteed a return on the investment. Uh, they've still got to operate it, but uh, the trick of the boy in mind, there's no market price of using the airport. The government, uh, 
Airports themselves are quite an interesting thing, and I've never looked into it, but around the world I'm fascinated by how big airports might be private or government, and I've never really understood why. Why are some airports viably private operations and some are government operations, and are they competing on level playing fields? And uh, I, I just don't know the answer. That, that's a whole area of expertise that, that would be interesting to know about. I think it's And Leon, just thinking about the legal side of things, but less about compliance with the Companies Act, more about compliance with the Competition Act. How legal are these subsidies? And I don't have the answer. I've been sitting here thinking about it. Clearly, the effect of these subsidies is to create an imbalance. It's, it's, it's not to have level um, playing fields. And I was just wondering if there's anyone here who can comment on that and give us the answer. To my mind, the purpose of the Competition Act is there to promote competition, what is happening would seem to be derogated from playing equal playing fields and the competition. The good news is there's someone in the room who probably knows more than anyone else in South Africa. I know. But because I he has himself been involved in Competition Act cases. The bad news is that he probably would rather not yes, tell us about I'm it. Uh, but exactly. nonetheless, if, he, if he's willing to, he can stand up and <laughs> tell us. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, Thank you. Please take who you are. Please take who you are. Oh, there you are, Dave. Just study. Yeah, we did actually take the matter to court, um, not competition court, but high court, on the basis of, uh, of numerous infringements of uh, the PFMA and, and various other areas. Uh, from a pure competition law perspective, we haven't got any competition law in South Africa that specifically deals with this matter. So in the EU and, and many other areas, you have competition law that specifically deals with the state subsidy um, just to SOEs. But in South Africa, that segment of the competition law was never included. And um, in fact, um, Josh Davies, he, he wrote a book on the competition law, and he said that's the biggest regret is that when he set up the competition regulations in South Africa, they never actually included a segment on state funding and state competition against the private sector. So, um, unfortunately, we could only take it on the basis of, uh, of various other seg uh, segments of the law. Um, but at the time, the guarantees were still, it was still being argued that the guarantees would never be called on and that SA would be able to repay what it's funding. And on that basis of that, that argument uh, and various other rather strange uh, concepts, uh, Judge Fabricius has actually ruled that um, the, the subsidies were legal. But of course, you know, if you had to rule it again today, having seen that now government is actually having to pay out on those on those guarantees, he might come up with a completely different ruling. But uh, the, one of the big aspects that we relied on in the case was that there was policy published originally back in 91, 92, when, when the, when the uh, domestic airspace was deregulated, that specifically said in government policy, in writing, that um, South African Airways would have no unfair advantage over competitors, including state subsidies, etc. And this was actually to entice the private sector into the aviation space. Um, but in the ruling um, by Dr. Fabricius, he first of all said that government has got no obligation to comply with policy. And secondly, that the public sector has got no, can have no expectation of, having, of being able to rely on policy. So it makes one wonder what the point was of, of, is of any policy. Government doesn't have to comply with it, the public sector can't rely on it. Uh, so, yeah, like, like I said, if you're going to get again today, maybe have a different answer, considering that these, these, these guarantees are coming home to roost now. Thanks very much. It is a, a case, by the way, that I've discussed with some top jurists in South Africa, including most recently Dali and Pofu, is whether there isn't a constitutional case to force government to comply with its policies. Uh, there's a section 195 of the Constitution that says for policy to be adopted, there must be public consultation. And then to go through all the compliance with the constitutional processes of formulating policy and then have a position where the government can just ignore it or abandon it, which it's done in many cases. Take Eskom, the 1998 white paper on energy says that there should be 30% of energy should now be supplied by private generating companies. 
and they've not been allowed in and the policy's never been implemented. And that policy was repeated in the National Development Plan. So in other words, the government twice over has adopted widely publicized policy. And you know, if I were from Eskom, I would say in my defense, we were told not to build new power stations because new power stations would be built by private competitors entering the market. So Eskom's directors and managers, at least in, in, in that sense, operated perfectly rationally by saying we're not going to build new power stations, 30% is going to be private. But the government just simply ignored its own policy. So whether it should be allowed to do that is another question. And then when the private sector, say Eskom in this case, an autonomous state company or an autonomous company, uh, but if Eskom takes it at its word and says this is the official policy, he has the white paper, he has the NDP, therefore we are not building more power stations, and then the government doesn't allow, doesn't license private competitors, then should they have a damages action? Should they be able to do something? And this is, as, as, a, as we sit here now, an unresolved question in constitutional law. Uh, and I, I, I'm hoping that I can find a peg on which to bring a case for this to be tested. Can you adopt a policy and then just ignore it? The Constitution surely can't mean go through all of these elaborate processes and then they have no consequence. That would be a sham. And the, the Constitution surely doesn't create a sham. It must mean something. It must say, once you've done this, then you must implement the policy. You're obligated to, and you would go to court, as you well know, and ask for a mandamus. You would force the government to implement its policy. I would, I would say that the Constitutional Court should be partial to such an argument, that, that it doesn't want the Constitution just to be meaningless, which is what this renders it. I'm under the impression that SAA gives um, gives cabinet members free free flights for life. If I'm correct in that assumption, uh, would that explain why they want to keep SAA up? I uh, is that true, Eric? I don't know to what extent, but I know they get to the extent uh, the, the, the staff get free for life for life, including mm -hmm. for their family. Mm -hmm. so we've got an interesting case of an engineer who retired from SAA at I think 60 years old. He's now still working for us uh, at, as a con contractor at 83 years old, and he still gets free flights for his whole family after working for Comair for 23 years on SAA. Wow. Um, so <laughs> well, that is, a, that, is, you know, that is a very important... If there is a self-interest, for example, in politicians to keep the farce going, then as a South African, I would say we have to bribe them out of it. We just have to make them a better offer. We have to say if we give you... Business class. You know, for example, there was this talk about the Gerana, the new CEO, being paid whatever it was. He was paid, I think it was four and a half million or something at Vodacom. So people say, well, how much is SAA West paying him? And I say, probably too little, because if he really can turn it around and he saves us three billion a year loss, I would say pay him a billion a year. That'll be a bargain. Be cheap at the price. So if there's a, way, a cheap way of getting the cabinet to fly everywhere, you know, we just say we'll give Comair or British Airways or Emirates or somebody, uh, or just give the cabinet minister. Say we, we're taking away your flying rights, but he has a billion rand. Go on holiday. Last question. Yeah, just... Um, I see you speak to Darlene Porfu, but you must, other than talking nice constitutional stuff with them, you must tell him to get his policies right, because he will go and nationalize Comair at the same time. But anyway, you can comment on that if you want. But um, aren't we just, you know, this whole thing of sell it, isn't it just a matter of time, a year, before they're going to have to sell? Because there's no money for these no. guarantees. So in my mind, in, I don't know, one month, six months, one year, maybe a bit longer, they're going to be sitting saying they have to sell. I just think this is the inevitable. There's no money to pay back for these guarantees for this, for Eskom, for anything. It's the money's run out. I, I would say there's a, that's quite probably right. Is yeah. they really just all they can do is they can cut the dog's tail off by the inch, but the dog's tail is going to be cut off. Yeah, they're going to have tea in the boardroom until yeah. this happens. Yeah. I think there is no real choice. Yeah. Is that uh, the last question? Any part one?
I think it depends on one's theory of inflation. If you're a monetarist Friedmanite like me, or Austrian school economics, you think inflation is caused by the quantity of money, the money supply. And uh, so you can have all the bailouts you want. They might be inefficient and they might prevent growth, but they're not inflationary. Uh, inflation is caused by there being more money relative to goods and services. In my view, that is the, call it the monetarist position. The quantity of money theory. And uh, I think that holds. I think all over the world, you know, the reason why uh, Zim, is at the entrance hall you'll see a $150 trillion Zim note. That, by the way, was after about 20 zeros had been knocked off. Now, if you know the name of 150 trillion plus 20 zeros, then you earn a sort of linguistic prize. But nonetheless, that is caused just by printing dollars. <coughs> it is just by making more money. And in South Africa, our Reserve Bank knows that. Its policy on, on uh, inflation targeting or interest rate targeting is purely they raise or lower the interest rate. If people want, if, if the banks are drawing more money, they raise the interest rate. And so basically what they're really doing is quantity of money control. They don't call it that, and they should. They should actually just say, we will keep the quantity of money stable. But in, they do it in the circuitous way, what's called a blunt instrument of interest rates. But in the end, inflation is about the quantity of money. So bad as the bailouts are, I don't think they can be said to cause inflation. I don't want to, put, I don't want to blame everything on them. I don't want to you know, blame... Uh, Dali and Pofu's economic theories on bailouts, for example. Yeah. Okay, that's the last question. Leon, thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to join us for snacks and further conversation, please do. The immediate release went out at 12 o'clock today, which summarizes Leon's presentation. Also, his slides and other papers are available if you would like it. And there's a lot of information about SAA going back to the court case we had, we um, uh, comment. Uh, uh, took the government to court, sorry, took SAA to court. Uh, there's a lot of information about that and the subsequent competition case um, on our website. So please do have a look at that. Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you.